Mark Few and Scott Drew are not talking about that secret scrimmage on Saturday. We're going to discuss what we know about the scrimmage, what we might learn, and why it's probably not going to be all that much on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Zags podcast. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Prize Picks. Folks, go to prizepicks.com slash college and use the promo code Locked On College, and you'll get a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Happy Monday, happy final days of October. Calendar flips to November this week, and we got real Gonzaga basketball to talk about on Friday when they take on Lewis Clark State in their first official exhibition game of the season. Today is also Mailbag Monday. As a reminder, for those of you who want to get involved in Mailbag Monday, easiest way to do so is to join our Discord channel. There is a link in the show notes, whether you're on YouTube or on an audio platform, you click that link, you accept the invite, you are in. We're talking Gonzaga basketball 24-7 there. Fantastic way to get those questions answered. You can also email me, andypatton013 at gmail.com. You can also reach out on Twitter, andypattoncbb. We've got a lot of fantastic questions to get to today, so we're going to get right into it. Both Darren and Jamie on Twitter asked about scrimmage results. We also got a question from Grand Chef Auto on Discord who said, what's the deal with not leaking scrimmage details? I get what Trilly said about mutual respect, but lots of programs have mutual respect between them and the details still get out. So yeah, here's the situation with the Gonzaga Baylor scrimmage. It happened on Saturday. That's pretty much the extent of what we know. Uh, Trilly Donovan's a Twitter account, for those of you who are not on social media, uh, very plugged in person. They uh, get a lot of results from these secret scrimmages, a lot of transfer portal information. Uh, And basically they said, we're probably not going to find out much about Gonzaga and Baylor. Mentioned the mutual respect between the coaching staffs. Basically the way to answer this, the way I interpreted it, is that these two teams don't want they don't want they don't want people to know. I mean, I think that's obvious. That's why you schedule a secret scrimmage is you don't want people to know the results. But I think part of it is that they're probably working on a lot of things together in a way that makes the results of a scrimmage particularly unimportant. By what I mean by that is playing players out of position, stopping play to correct a player's position. Like if, you know, if Mark Few says, hold on, timeout, stop, and goes to correct, you know, where Luka Krinovich is standing or what Pavel Stosius is doing, you know, guys who are newer to the program, like those kind of things may be happening. I don't know. I wasn't in the building, of course. If I knew, I would tell you. But my guess is that these scrimmages, the, the reason they want this to be secret is because it is not being put together the way a traditional scrimmage would be. And because there's so much tinkering and lineup changes and players not playing and guys playing out of positions, the results are just kind of meaningless. And so the coaching staffs don't want them out there. They don't want people making decisions or opinions on Gonzaga or Baylor based on, you know, seeing the box score results of a game where the actual product on the court was so unlike an actual game that it's kind of irrelevant. This is mostly speculation on my part, to be clear. I don't know. Maybe they went out there and completely treated it like a normal game and did not do any tinkering, any adjustment whatsoever. But to me, I think that they wanted to get a chance to play real competition. They wanted a chance to play somebody other than their own team, but they wanted the opportunity to do it without the pressure of what if this result gets leaked? What if people talk about how so-and-so didn't play, so-and-so did this, whatever, and they just didn't want any of that. That's their prerogative. Secret scrimmages exist for a reason, and there's a real chance that we are not going to hear much uh, of anything about this uh, scrimmage going forward. That's just part of the deal. Next question here comes from Austin via Discord. Austin says, which Zag combination will average more points per game? Will it be Drew Timmy and Nolan Hickman, or will it be Ryan Nempard and Graham E.K.? So last year, I'm assuming this is on a year-to-year basis. Last year, Drew Timmy and Nolan Hickman combined to average 28.9 points per game. 
Majority of that, of course, came from Drew Timmy. I think he had 21.2, Hickman 7.7, combined just under 29 points per game. Looking at, listening back to my preseason predictions, the uh, the player previews we've been doing, Ryan Nempart and Graham E.K. are two of the player previews that have already been done. They're already in your feed. Check them out if you have not done so yet. I predicted about 16 points per game for E.K. I predicted somewhere between 15 and 17 points per game for Nempart. You add that together, you're right around 30, 31 points per game. In theory, that would make me projecting that EK and Nemhard combined will score more points than Timmy and Hickman. So I'm going to stick with that. I think it's going to be more balanced. I think it kind of has to be more balanced. And Nolan Hickman wasn't a particularly great scorer last year. I think he will score more this year in a different role off the ball. But I expect Nemhard and EK to probably be Gonzaga's two leading scorers, health of course, assuming for Graham E.K., I think Watson's probably going to be in double figures. I think there's a real chance that Hickman and Venters at least compete to be in double figures, somewhere 8, 9, 10 points per game for those guys. But I think for the most part, Nemhard and E.K. will probably be the team's two leading scorers. And while nobody's going to top 21 points per game the way that Timmy did, I think ultimately the two of them combined can score more points on a per-game basis than Hickman and Timmy did together last year. Next question here comes from White Chocolate on Discord, who says, last year you predicted the leader in three-point percentage, Malachi Smith, and top three-pointers made, Julian Strother, correctly. Let's try it again. Who will lead the Zags in three-point percentage and three-pointers made? Well, I'm glad that I got it right last year. Uh, This year, I think it's a little bit more challenging, but I'm actually going to go with the same guy for both. Maybe that makes it easier. I guess we'll find out. I'm going with Steel Venters. I think Steel Venters is pretty clearly my choice for most three-pointers made. That is his role on this team. Even as the Big Sky player of the year last year, Steel Venters mostly scored, and he mostly scored from, from deep. 15 points per game, barely two rebounds, I think under or right around two assists per game. Like He's not a facilitator. He's not a great rebounder. He's not a particularly great defender. We'll see how he adjusts to being in a different role. But Gonzaga brought him to Spokane to shoot threes. And I think he's going to do a whole bunch of them. And I think being in the WCC, being Gonzaga's fifth option offensively, I think for the most part, when he's on the floor, he's option four or five is going to lead to him getting a lot of open looks from three. And that is what he's going to do. I think he shoots close to 50%. And I think he takes a bunch of them. So for me, I'm going to go with Steel Venters being the leader in both these categories for this season. I think Nolan Hickman's three-point percentage will improve. I think Ben Greggs could improve. He could be right around 40%. Hickman could be high 30%. But I think Steele's 45-plus, and I don't think any of the freshmen are going to top that. It's rare for freshmen to do so. I don't think Nembhard's going to take that big of a leap uh, unless, you know, somebody like Graham E.K. or or Braden Huff goes one for one, and we're counting that in terms of percentages. I think uh, Steele Ventures is going to be the guy who wins both these awards this year. Final question here in the first segment comes from JC at Lothar King on Twitter, who says, what percent chance do you give the Zags to play in Spokane for the opening weekend of the NCAA tournaments? Basically a top four seed. This is kind of a cop-out answer, so I apologize for that ahead of time, but I'm just going to go 50-50 because I think that's kind of right where Gonzaga is right now. Haven't seen an actual game yet, so clearly it's, it's, it's early to be making these kinds of predictions, but I... I'm going to have Gonzaga probably between 15 and 20 on my top 25 list, which we're going to talk about on a future episode of Lockdown College Basketball. Check that show out if you haven't done so yet. But for me, I think Gonzaga is kind of right in that four or five seeded range. And I think that's where they'll, where they'll be come March. They'll win a couple of these really premier non-conference games. They'll lose a couple of these premier non-conference games. I think they'll probably split with St. Mary's, maybe lose one other game in WCC play, finish the season with six seven maybe losses somewhere in there, a couple marquee wins, probably puts them in the conversation as a four seed, maybe a three seed, but also maybe a five seed. So they're going to be right on that line. So give me 50-50 right now. And I think there's a good chance that Gonzaga does get a chance to play in Spokane, but it wouldn't shock me if, unfortunately, they just miss out this season. Well, the Big 12 and the Big East are both somewhat competing for Gonzaga services in conference realignment. We're going to talk more about that after we discuss Chet Holmgren, who is today's Game Changer of the Week as brought to you by the Athletic Brewing Company. Because much like Holmgren over the weekend, Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. 
They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. And speaking of good, folks, Holmgren, 16 points, 13 boards, and seven blocks in his second NBA game. No rookie has ever done that. It was a tremendous performance from Chet. Once again, Athletic Brewing Company completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. They are full of flavor and well-crafted, just like a full-strength beer. You can find Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you, or you can buy them online at athleticbrewing.com. First-time customers can use promo code LOCKEDON to get 15% off of your first online order. That's code LOCKEDON at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. Folks, passion, drive, and patience, those are the things that bring home the winning trophy, and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts to choose from for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your car every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that trophy. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Folks, want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners checking out the show on YouTube. Shout out to those of you asking great mailbag questions on our Discord channel. And that's what I want to get into now. We got a handful of questions about conference realignment, the never ending storyline of Gonzaga basketball, of Gonzaga athletics, really of the NCAA these last couple of years. This question here comes from Grand Chef Otto on Discord, who says, Brett Yormark is in Spokane. If Gonzaga were to join the Big 12, is there any way to escape being a, quote, kid at the adults table due to their lack of football? If the Big East ever became a realistic option, it seems like a big point in their favor. We're going to talk about Gonzaga and the Big East. Don't you worry. We're going to get to that right after this. But in terms of the kid at the dinner table kind of comparison for Gonzaga, I think this is kind of a user perception issue. Will there be fans? Big 12 football fans, general college football fans, general anti-Gonzaga fans who treat Gonzaga as second class in the Big 12 because they do not have football? Yes. Will Gonzaga make less money than the other Big 12 schools because they don't have football? Yes, of course. That is absolutely part of that. But in terms of perceiving ourselves as the kid at the adults table, your mark is not considering Gonzaga that. Many of the ADs and presidents allowing Gonzaga into the Big 12 would not perceive perceive them like that. Yes, there is an obvious difference with Gonzaga being a non-football school in a football conference. It is unavoidable. It is a clear delineation between them and the other schools, and it will have a financial impact. But we do not have to perceive ourselves as a kid at the dinner table. Like That is not the perception that we have to have. Fans may have it, but I'm not going to consider us that. Yes, there are reasons that the Big East might make more sense, and we'll talk about that momentarily. But if the Big 12, if enough of their people vote to say, yes, this basketball brand is worth it to be in our conference, then that inferiority complex that people may feel, that people may try to push on us, kind of only affects us if we let it. I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to feel like Gonzaga is in any way inferior in the Big 12 because I care about basketball and I'm not as concerned about the football. But I know that that perception will be there. It's kind of up to you whether you to let it let it help define how you feel about Gonzaga or not. Next couple of questions here come from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, could comments from the Big East this week have made Gonzaga a more expensive prospect for the Big 12? Also, could this give the Big East time until the conference is ready to renegotiate their media rights deal next summer, which could include adding Gonzaga? Or could this be the Big East blowing smoke that they will never really follow up on? Yeah, so Big East Commissioner Val Ackerman spoke to media. She addressed the Gonzaga rumors, basically said there's no better fit for Gonzaga than the Big East. We've been keeping in contact with them. In terms of reading into those comments, I think it's context is really important here. If the way that Brett Yormark came out and, and brought Gonzaga to the Big 12 rumors back to the limelight, he leaked sources, sources were speaking about it. Like this was an intentional leak of information to get Gonzaga and the Big 12 back in the 
you know, the lexicon of, of discourse online. Val Ackerman, from my understanding, was directly asked about Gonzaga to the Big East and answered it appropriately and honestly by saying, we think they're a good fit for our conference. We're still having those conversations. But there is a big difference between being directly asked a question and being, for lack of a better word, forced to respond versus choosing to bring up a story on your own. If Val Ackerman walks into Big East Media Days and says, we're seriously considering adding Gonzaga, that is a much different conversation than being directly asked about it and responding to it. So I think that's that's where you want to have that context and that understanding of, of you know, when people choose to talk about certain topics and not. In terms of the Big East interest in Gonzaga, it makes the most sense for it to be in 2025 when they are renegotiating their media rights deal. Could Brett Yormark and the Big 12 try to sneak Gonzaga in before that? Yes. Does that create a bit of a potential bidding war for these two sides? Yes. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing. And I want to address that in the follow-up question here, also by Jeff via Gmail, who says, if the Big 12 does not add Gonzaga in July of 2024, could we be looking at the prospect of the two best basketball conferences entering into a bidding war of sorts for which conference gets to add Gonzaga in 2025? If you could pick which conference would you want Gonzaga in the future? So yes, I do think that the fact that there's a lot of Big 12 leadership who is saying, hey, why why now? Why rush this? It doesn't make sense for us to, to do a, a rushed vote on getting Gonzaga in right now. That is the communication we're seeing from some Big 12 leadership. That is likely going to lead, in my opinion, to Gonzaga not getting added to the Big 12 in the upcoming cycle. But I also agree that it could create a situation where there is more interest in Gonzaga because the Big East might get involved when that media deal is up. They have media deals. ESPN loves Gonzaga for them. If they want to renegotiate, make some more money, bring some more money back to their member institutions, keep UConn happy, they got to find ways to generate more interest. Their product is phenomenal right now, but guess what? It's better with Gonzaga. It's better if Gonzaga is in the Big 12 they, or in the Big East. They know that. They know they can leverage that for more money, but they have to be willing to gamble on the fact that the Big 12 is not going to add them ahead of time. I think it's a gamble worth taking for the Big East because the schools that don't want Gonzaga now, West Virginia, potentially BYU, whoever else it might be, who are saying, hey, let's pump the brakes. Let's not vote on this right now. They're probably not going to change their minds. So how, how does your mark get more schools in the Big 12? to? They have to be able to have the numbers. The, ex, the understanding right now is that they do not. So what changes for that to happen? And does it change within a year? Those are the questions that need to be addressed. And if the Big 12 can't get those minds to be changed, then the Big East might be very wise to wait, wait till that new negotiation comes out, and then bam, get that information from Gonzaga. Get that you know understanding of what it would do for them financially. Go back to ESPN, go back to their broadcast partners and say, look, this is what happens if we add Gonzaga. This is how much money we make. Pay us this amount of money per school. We'll add Gonzaga. Bing, we're done. I think that's absolutely possible. And in terms of a better pick, it's tough because the Big 12, from a brand recognition perspective, from an opponent caliber perspective with Kansas and Houston and Arizona and Baylor and everybody that they'd play is really hard to turn down. But Gonzaga being in the Big East is a more logical fit in terms of institutional alignment, in terms of not having football. And I think it's safer for Gonzaga long term. The Big East is not going anywhere. And I'm not saying the Big 12 is going anywhere either, but if the Big 12, if they want to do a break off with football focused, it does, it goes back to that first conversation. Gonzaga is an outlier in the Big 12. Does it mean they get cut? Probably not. I'm sure they would negotiate some kind of security net uh, if they were to join the Big 12, but the Big East makes more sense in terms of long-term security, comfort, knowing you're in a conference that fits your needs institutionally. I think the basketball is comparable in both. Certainly the travel's worse in the Big East, but the travel's bad either way. I would prefer the Big East. If you prefer the Big 12, I get it. I'm not going to argue with you, to be honest. I think there is a really compelling reason to be concerned about both and a really compelling reason to be on board with both. But I would lean lean Big East because I think it's just a little bit more secure for Gonzaga in terms of feeling more comfortable in the place that they're at. Final question here before we get into the last segment comes from Zag Nutty on Discord, who says, 
If Gonzaga goes to the Big 12 and has more seasons where they are a bubble team, would that have a negative effect on recruiting? I realize the NCAA tournament is likely to change, but for the way things are now, does it move to the Big 12? A conference the Zags won't dominate as much as the WCC, potentially negatively impact recruiting, or is it a positive because players value the conference the school is in more than postseason potential? I guess I'm not sure on the last part if, if players – like I don't, I don't know that we're going to blanket statement what players value coming out of high school because I just don't think that's right or an accurate way to talk about it. But Gonzaga going to the Big 12 absolutely helps them from a recruiting perspective, 100%. It's one of the biggest things knocked against Gonzaga right now is teams saying, oh, good luck in the WCC. You're not going to be on TV. You're not going to be playing marquee opponents, blah, blah, blah. And it, it is a, a huge hurdle. The fact that Gonzaga has recruited as well as they have – in the WCC is remarkable. They would get a big bump going to the Big 12. Gonzaga also recruits internationally. They recruit in the transfer portal. Like they're getting more higher ranking high school recruits is not the biggest priority for Gonzaga. It's not even close. Something fans are very concerned about. We talk about it a lot uh, on the Discord channel, on the show, whatever. Why isn't Gonzaga recruiting more four stars? Why aren't they getting five stars? It's because it's just not the biggest way for them to build talent. I think Gonzaga gets a bump in the in the recruiting world. I think they get a bump in the transfer portal war, uh, world by going to the Big 12. But I don't think that it's the driving factor for teams. Teams aren't going to be like, well, what if Gonzaga's on the bubble? First of all, until Gonzaga doesn't make the tournament, there's still a team that keeps making the tournament. So I'm not really worried about, yes, Gonzaga's likelihood of their streak continuing maybe takes a bit of a hit. But very few recruits are concerned about that as much as they're concerned about being on TV and getting the development they need to be an NBA player and, you know, competing for championships. All those things are still true at Gonzaga. And now you feel even more confident because of the non-comp or the, the teams you play in conference play. It should do nothing but help Gonzaga's recruiting. Well, closing out the show, talking about my favorite Zag of all time, Chet Holmgren's dominance in the NBA, as well as an anecdote about Gonzaga and Boise State all coming up. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Prize Picks, because folks, right now you can use Prize Picks as weekly promotions that lead you to big payouts like their Taco Tuesday deals. Every Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide you with even more value. Beyond that, Prize Picks also has a re reboot policy where your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So, for NFL games or college football top 25 matchups, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and they do not return in the second half, that player is rebooted. This is unprecedented in the daily fantasy sports space. Price Picks is the only app that has this injury insurance. Beyond that, this app, it's really, really easy to use. All you do is pick two or more players and you choose more or less with that given stat. Chet Holmgren, more or less than four and a half blocks. We might be smashing more right now after he recorded seven in his second NBA game. All you do is you hit more or less, you get it right, boom, you get paid. So go to pricepicks.com slash college. Use that promo code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match of up to $100. Again, that's pricepicks.com slash locked on college. Use promo code locked on college for a first deposit match of up to $100. Price picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, folks, closing out the show today with more Mailbag Monday questions. These next two come from Austin via Discord. Austin says, who is your favorite Zag of all time? Can be for any reason. And he says his favorite is Rob Sacre uh, because he's one of the greatest personalities. Yes, Rob is fantastic. Love that pick. I'm going to go with a couple. I'll go with Mike Hart. Mike Hart was kind of my first favorite Zag player. He was there the same four years that I was at school, seeing his rise from walk-on, who you know wasn't even in, on the bench during craziness in the kennel, uh, to being a starter for the number one team in the country is just a tremendous story. I literally walk on to starting for the first Gonzaga team to ever be ranked number one. I've met him personally, I have friends who are close with him. And so for me, that's kind of puts him at the top of that conversation. Love Killian Tilly. My dog's named Tilly after him. Fantastic four-year career at Gonzaga. Been one of my favorites of all time. Also absolutely adore Shem. So Shem, Tilly, and Mike Hart are going to be my answers for that question right now. Next question, also from Oscar, um, excuse me, also from Austin via Discord. He says, who is the biggest Zag nemesis? Meaning when you hear that name, you cringe, maybe you gag thinking about them. His example was Omar Samhan, and my answer is also Omar Samhan. Um, again, era dependent for me, certainly, uh, was 
freshman year was his sophomore year and uh, being in the student section and being in the uh, in the line for that game and just hearing people talk about him and how much they disliked him and how loud we had to be about him kind of got me really riled up going to my first Gonzaga St. Mary's game. So he has kind of always been that that public villain figure uh, from St. Mary's. There's a couple guys who didn't play as much who were villainous to me. I was uh, Mitchell Young, Bo Levesque were guys who who kind of taunted the student section a lot when we were there and kind of helped beef up that rivalry, even though neither of them were big time minutes guys for St. Mary's. So certainly some guys in that school who've, who've made themselves enemies, which is kind of part of the reason that you got to love those, those rivalry type matchups. Next question here, another one from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, how about Chet Holmgren's 16 points, 13 boards, and seven blocks performance? Feels like if he keeps performing like that, he could be rookie of the year regardless of what other rookies do this season. Yeah, absolutely. I think Chet's going to continue to fill a really valuable role for Oklahoma City. He's not going to score as much as Wembenyana, I suspect, because he's not going to be asked to, but he's going to be highly efficient. He's going to get those block shots. I mean, he did that against Evan Mobley, a, a long, lanky, a well-scoring big man for out of USC for Cleveland, and he blocked seven shots. So I think Chet's going to put together enough numbers to be a real consideration. But unless he absolutely dominates Victor Wembanyama, I think Victor is going to take it because of how much hype he has coming into the season. Two more questions here. Another one from Jeff. Jeff says, did you happen to see the joint interview Mark Few and Leon Rice had during the WCC Mountain West Conference Media Days? They were asked whose fault is it that Gonzaga and Boise State have not played yet. They both responded by saying they don't have any intention of scheduling games. Their families vacation together every summer. They feel like playing against each other may complicate their longstanding relationships. Yeah, good for them. You got a boundary, enforce it. I think that I don't think there's anything wrong with this. Uh, certainly something that we've seen from Gonzaga in the past when those assistant coaches move on, they tend to not schedule each other. We haven't seen Gonzaga and Arizona schedule each other, Gonzaga and Long Beach State where Dan Monson coaches, and of course, Gonzaga and Boise State. And I think this is a reasonable boundary to set. Gonzaga having these close relationships with the coaching staffs who move on, you know, Mark Few being close with Leon, being close with Tommy, being close with Dan. I think that's part of what sets Gonzaga apart. That family atmosphere is truly something that makes this program so special, but I can see why it creates these situations where you don't want to play those teams. Gonzaga and Arizona are going to play each other. It's going to happen. Those two teams are such significant brands that I don't think they can avoid playing each other forever. But Gonzaga and Boise State can, and until until one of those two coaches isn't there, I think they're going to continue to do so. Is it a bummer? Sure. It would be fun to see those two teams play each other, but I think they're totally within their, their reasoning for wanting to have that boundary right there between the two of them. Final question of the show comes from Wade via Discord. Wade says, while this isn't strictly a Gonzaga question, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Elam ending and how it would affect, if it would affect, Gonzaga specifically and college basketball if implemented. Yeah, so to be honest, I don't really have a strong opinion on the Elam ending. I think it's fun in the basketball tournament. I think it's fun in specific events like all-star games or, or, you know, other types of tournaments. Like I think it's a, I don't want to say gimmicky because I don't think it's intended to be gimmicky, but I think when it's utilized in events that are already unique, like the basketball tournament is, like, you know, in-season tournaments might be, like, you know, just, just all-star games, those kinds of things, I think it works well there. I don't, I wouldn't love it if it were just like blanket statement introduced in Division One college basketball. I don't think that's going to happen. I wouldn't love that because I think it's a pretty dramatic change to just throw into a sport. But I, if if it's what people wanted, like if everybody was clamoring for the Elam ending, I'm not. I don't feel so negatively about it that I would be like, no, this is terrible for the game. Like if people want it, great. It adds intrigue to the end of games. What does it do for Gonzaga? Not much. A lot of Gonzaga games are blowouts. Elam ending is just kind of irrelevant for blowouts. Close games would be close games regardless of whether there was an Elam ending ruling or not. So I don't think it makes a huge impact on Gonzaga in particular. I wouldn't love it as an implementation in Division One college basketball, but I don't feel so strongly anti-Elam ending that if people wanted it, that I would, that I would stand in the way of that progress going forward. That's going to wrap us up for today here on the Locked On Zags podcast, folks. We got bold predictions scary bold predictions, bold predictions. So scary. We're releasing them on Halloween. So check out the show on Tuesday for all of those bold predictions. We'll also continue our player preview series as we get into the rest of the week. And of course, Gonzaga's exhibition game on November 3rd against Lewis Clark state. Thank you so much for listening. Join us on discord, smash that like button on YouTube, whatever it may be. We appreciate all of you for taking time to listen to the show. And until next time, as always go Zags.